attention to some detail or aspect of X. Thus a person can pay respect to, in the sense of pay attention to or consider, just one feature, say, of their car, its colour or its make, but not pay respect, that is, attention, to any other feature of the car, such as its fuel efficiency. In this sense, an atheist can pay respect to the Bible, like Hobbes, Hume, Gibbon and many others. They can pay careful attention to what the Bible says, but remain sceptical of or disbelieve its central claims. <coughs> respect to. In this sense, a person does not interfere with the actions of another person, or they actively, not passively, let that person be to do their thing. Thus, a person can respect, in the sense of not interfere with, another person's betting on horses or going to their, or going to their chosen church, even though they think that both bets are an utter waste of time. They do not interfere with the others gambling or going to church, they simply let others be to do their thing. Under this heading, we can also consider giving respect to, respect in the sense to, to a person's liberty or right to believe or act in that we do not interfere with them. This is a quite fundamental kind of respect that takes a particular kind of object, namely the rights and liberties of a person. This is an important matter that has already arisen with the Atatürk thesis, and it will ar arise again later. Respect three. In this sense, a person is considerate, polite, civil, or courteous towards other people. So, so to those who offer their religious beliefs, one can simply say politely, thanks, but no thanks. When one, finally see, when one finds, say, evangelicals at the door who remain intrusively persistent and so impolite, a modicum of disrespect can become appropriate. Here I want to make a brief digression into why politeness and civility about religious matters is beginning to decline. Until the turn of the century, even though there were different views about religion, people tended not to attack one another on grounds of religion. But perhaps Northern Ireland and what went on in the former Yugoslavia were exceptions, but these were largely contained. However, this entente cordiale has been put under severe strain with the growing assertiveness of religion and political life from the, views, from the views of people like President George Bush and his faith politics, and the views of advocates of intelligent design who hope to combat the theory of Darwinian evolution, to bombers who want to blow themselves and others up. Perhaps the origins of this can be traced further back to the attacks on Salman Rushdie by Muslims outraged by his alleged profanities in his 1988 book, The Satanic Verses. Out of happenings like these grew the assertiveness of religious groups with their demands for respect. For non-believers, this raises a centuries-old horror of demands made by the religious for societies to be more regulated according to the precepts of their sacred books. The religious have an advantage here in that they nearly always exist in organized groups. In contrast, the non-religious do not. Apart from a few small organizations, they tend to be individuals, who do not enter into collective organizations. But with the growing assertiveness of religions with their demand for respect and demands for greater obedience to the tenets of their sacred books, any earlier entente cordiale has come under severe strain. There's been a growing response by non-believers to protect the hard-won secular state that has been fought for during earlier centuries. So once where there, were cons there was considerable politeness and restraint, there is now much less in the face of the assertiveness of religion, of which the demand for respect is just one aspect. So if one looks to the current decline of politeness and civility, it is to be found in demands of the religious to which the resurgent atheism of people such as Richard Dawkins has been a response. Well, after this digression, let's return to the kinds of respect and mention the fourth kind of respect. So respect for... In this sense, a person can have admiration for another or their abilities. Thus, one can respect another's piano playing in the sense that they admire it. Here, it's important to note the different objects of respect for. One can respect for a person's skill, for example, in cracking a safe, but not respect for that person in the sense of admire. <clears throat> At this point, one must be aware of an important phenomenon that the philosopher Simon Blackburn calls respect creep. Respect for goes along with respect three. 
That is, admiration for a person commonly goes along with politeness towards them. But the converse is not true. One can have respect free for a person in the sense of being polite to them, but not have respect for in the sense of admiring them. It's fallacious to respect creep from the third kind of respect, politeness to the fourth, admiration. Respect five. In this sense, a person has deferential esteem for, or reverence for, or honours, or venerates some object X, whatever it be. For example, Zoroastrians have respect five for their prophet Zoroaster and their Zoroastrian god, Ahura Mazda, in that they revere, esteem, honour, and venerate both. But do any of us pay, pay respect to this prophet or god in the sense of revere either of them? In the case of the Zoroastrian god, apart from a very tiny minority, the rest of us do not accord it any respect because we do not believe that it exists. Most of us are atheists with respect to Ahura Mazda. What of respect creep? Respect five for a god or a prophet goes along with respect for being an admirer and respect three being polite about them. But the converse is not true. Admiration of or politeness towards some X can occur without reference, but without reverence for X. Respect creep from the third or fourth kinds of respect to the fifth is fallacious. Respect six. Respect five involves an evaluation which is made by an individual or a group. Some person or group may, as a matter of fact, value or revere the, the Zoroastrian God, just as another individual or group may, as a matter of fact, value and revere the Christian God. <coughs> Importantly, respect five is not a normative matter in the sense of being binding on others. What respect six adds to respect five is such a normative dimension which goes beyond the individual character of respect five in that it is deemed to be universally binding on all others, something all others ought to do. Respect six does this in two ways typical of the demands associated with the sacred. First, those who respect five in the sense of revere some object X demand that all others also ought to revere X. Or secondly, the demand might be slightly weaker those who revere X demand that others not criticize, insult, or denigrate X, or at least conform outwardly to the demands of reverence. Think of all the times atheists have been stuck at a table at which grace uh, has been said. The demands can also extend to prohibitions against lampooning or poking fun or satirizing X in any way, for example, the Danish cartoons. Here the demand for reverence by others comes into conflict with and attempts to restrict free speech in ways which the other kinds of respect do not. Upon what grounds can those respectfully reverent towards some X demand the same reverence of others? Logically, there are none. Here the demands do not concern the kind of respect involved in paying attention to, that was respect one, or letting be, respect two, or being polite, that was respect three, these one can independently grant readily enough in most circumstances. <clears throat> Rather, one is obliged to admire, as respect four, or revere, respect five, what others admire or revere, or at least outwardly conform. What is deeply problematic about respect six is the fallacious manner in which respect five, reverence and esteem, is extended beyond the individual and the factual and is turned into a norm applicable to all.